Please welcome our next speaker, Stepan. Hey, nice to see you. Nice to be here. Finally, as a presenter on PyCon. Kudos for organizers to, for making this happen in these crazy times. Uh, first few words about myself. I'm Python developer for more than nine years, a bit more in IT in general. Uh, also work as a technical team leader or IT architect, depending on the case, on the project, on the ticket as well. I'm open source and DIY fan. Therefore, I have a few packages on PyPI. Uh, one of them is uh, in Jazz Band organization when I, where I maintain it. And I think that's it. In general, I like to code. So what we will talk about today uh, is typing, but as a general idea. I will not tell you how types are handled in C, Python, core, libs. I will not tell you how to configure your MyPy. Uh, I will try to show you uh, the general idea how to approach uh, typing in your uh, projects. Because there is one uh, question I asked myself some time ago. Uh, why people fall back to static languages? And by fallback, I really mean it's like degrading your work because dynamic languages uh, are the next step in languages evolution, I think so, right? We had machine uh, code, we have machine, uh, we have assemblies. And then we have static, uh, statically typed languages, and then we have dynamic languages, right? So I thought in the beginning of my career that this is like the next step where you should look at, but I think that many people are actually trying to use starting languages more nowadays. Uh, it's also because I do like how Python looks like. I do like programming it, it's fun. Uh, it's actually pseudo code that actually runs. It's super portable, you just copy paste, it's run, even from Stack Overflow. It happens that people trying to make pseudo code simply write Python code by, by accident. And uh, the other thing is, I don't really like starting languages. Like, if I see that, I don't really feel well. It's like, this is, uh, this is Java example, of course. It's like Vogon poetry for me. And with all due respect for what Java brought to world, I hate it. Uh, yeah, I think also there are people that do like Python, especially in the beginning of it, their careers. Uh, I talk to people that have like two years of experience during recruitments. Why did you choose Python? It is because it's simple, it's fun, it's easy, it's fast to program in. So, yeah. Uh, but the world is actually going in a different direction, right? Because uh, all the nice things that came in last 10 years, I think, uh, are mostly statically typed. Python. Uh, type hints, of course, that uh, are with us since 3.5, which kind of goes against the duck typing idea. Uh, all the dynamic languages that are quite popular have its own transpilers, so people can use static typing in the development. Like TypeScript for JavaScript, there was, uh, of course, uh, more for JavaScript itself. There's Hack for PHP. Uh, late, nice, popular languages like Go, Rust, uh, lately announced Carbon, they are all statically typed. And they have pretty nice stuff inside as well, because although I love duck typing, I love dynamic languages, uh, I must admit that I fell in love with Rust, and it has a lot of uh, nice things to it. I will talk about what we can learn from it later. Uh, yeah, so that would be the question of our sh short journey. Why do people fall back to static languages? Uh, there is also a secondary goal to that presentation, is to settle years-long debate. Is duck typing better duck than static typing? Because when I was still freshman, uh, I, was, I went to one of the uh, previous PyCon edition. I wanted to get my first job in Python. Uh, and I ran into this guy <coughs> that was you know, uh, static typing lover. 
we ran into discussion and, you know, from beer to beer, from world to world, it actually happened, he hired me as a Python developer. And here we are, nine years later, as Platinum sponsors, so I think you were expecting that, we are recruiting. Please visit us at our stand. We have tomorrow's session about recruitment. Uh, I will get back to that at the end of the presentation, but for now, let's dive into the, into the topic. So, for starter, we need a few rules to get through the topic. First is, of course, don't panic. Uh, it's more for me than you. Second is, always know what your type is. I will point out some hypocrisy of mine in this topic. Uh, because it's not like duck typing, I don't know if it's well seen. Uh, duck typing is not something that exists as a no typing solution. Duck typing and dynamic typing uh, can only successfully live in a language that is uh, strongly typed. And if you forget that there is type system beneath it, or you don't really care about types, you will run into issues. Uh, there are, of course, many languages, uh, let's say modern languages, because we are uh, uh, in this segment of high-level languages. So there is Erlang, Clojure, PHP, even JavaScript, Python, Haskell, etc., etc. This is all type, so pre please rem remember that. Third rule, <clears throat> actually there's no third rule. There are three books, although. Uh, I will use them to justify the problem. Because why do people love static languages? Well, they must uh, address some problems, right? And it's not really obvious, so I will spoil the fun and state this at the beginning. Uh, it's that. Learning is bottleneck. Learning between programmers, uh, learning uh, about the domain, etc., etc. And these three books actually justify it because this is actually the first thing you read in Agile Adoption Patterns. This is a book, how to apply Agile stuff in your company, in your project. And they focus mostly on leveraging the speed of learning between developers, uh, because that's the longest, the hardest, the most pricey thing there, there is. Uh, there is the book Mythical Mammoth, which is not really about programming per se, but uh, efficiency of programmers and work organization. But there is a nice chapter about how programming influences developers, uh, where author states that hermetization, which gave us like, you know, this all public protected private stuff, is not addressed for code, it's not addressed for machine, it is always addressed for people. Because developer can say which part of the code are important, but by making it public, which are, not, which are not so important by making them protected and private means that you possibly will never know and maybe you shouldn't know. Uh, there's a clean code, which is totally not about, not about learning as a domain problem, but you know, having clean code makes so much easier for us to read what's inside and therefore learn. So I'll take this as granted. Right? Learning is bottleneck. And, and we will make this journey about what's in it for us. And actually, I wanted to prove the point that duck typing is better, because why not? Uh, but before that, we need to dive into the good parts. Obviously, it's not uh, so easy to grasp, right? Let's explore the good parts. Why typing is there in the beginning? And it's obviously for memory management. Uh, since Autocode and early version of Fortran, uh, types were there to help developers to organize memory, to make this memory safe, to protect us from stupid things like that, because I believe this is possible in assembly. I think I could do that. And it does make sense for processor, but totally not for humans. So having typing inside of your code make this structure that keep you from do doing stupid things. Uh, and obviously, type languages are fast, right? This is a bit of shame to say about Python on PyCon, but we must state this. Uh, there is this great paper, 
energy efficiency across programming languages from 2017. And there is this table. I don't know if you see this well, uh, but this is quite popular table. And it so shows what, uh, what languages takes how much energy and time to uh, execute. And the, uh, the first language in the table is the fastest or the most energy saving or the most uh, energy, uh, memory saving. So we have Python, which is like 76 times worse than C in terms of energy, and in terms of time, it's 72. That's terrible, right? It's like, oh my god, let's, let's close this conference and choose another language. Uh, but the thing is that uh, this is not the reason why we are programming in Python. We don't choose Python to make it fast or energy efficient. We, make, we use it to make programming and development fast. This is the gain. Uh, but at the same time, this is the reason why Python is not a desktop, the, uh, desktop applications or your cell phone. It's just uh, too pricey. And this thing, memory management and typing for memory, is very important, but it's not addressing the problem of learning. I had to mention that, but let's dive into other stuff, like uh, documentation. Uh, this code you can see here is the same code, except for the upper part is typed, not typed, it's described in doc string, and the lower part is described with types, with type hints from the freshest Python. It's better. I don't know what you think, but I think it's much, much better. First, because it's more compact. Second, because the types there are subject to check. We can check that documentation is actually alive with MyPy. If something changes, MyPy will show that, hey, your type annotation says different thing. So next time developer will visit here, uh, he will know what he's dealing with. Uh, I had this example of lasagna code where there were so many layers of application and so many abstractions, and in between these layers, variables were named differently. Tracking that in Python code is just a nightmare. So even for that, type hints are nice, nice improvement. Mm. Next, and this is a power horse, and don't worry if you don't see the code really clearly, it's Rust anyway, so <clears throat> yeah. Uh, this is an example of the code where you can create state machine uh, that will validate itself on compile, compile time. And actually merging business terms with types gives you this great opportunity to validate your code, but not on memory management level, but on business uh, logic level, right? So uh, if you have payments and you will add new payment methods, maybe the times will show you that there is unhandled payment type uh, in your code, and you should do something about it. And having that in front of your face before making pull requests is just so much faster and so much nicer than um, showing this on production, right? It's a bit of, a little too late sometimes, and the, the debugging is uh, hell as well. Uh, so this is power horse of this whole typing, I think, pros, because if you connect typing model with your validation layer, it's super nice. And actually, I think domain-driven design is also about it, right? Create a domain in your native language, in your native types, validate this, and if it runs, it should mean, that doesn't always mean, but it should mean that it's fine. Another article, uh, also in terms of business model validation, uh, tests aren't enough, case study after adding type hints for URL3. So this library, URL3, is like one of the most downloaded libraries there is in Python. It exists for years. Uh, it's well known. It's uh, like something that maybe not benefit from adding any type hints to it because every possible test case is already covered. 
years of debugging on production gave us so many bug tickets that probably it should work next time you deploy it. Uh, but still, authors of this library uh, suggest that it made the code better. It made the code uh, easier to understand because they were addressing the issues that were not so simple to spot. And the last thing I want to talk about are obviously type hints, because why you do type hints if not for type hints in your IDE? And this is a bit of diving into the domain of uh, computer aided uh, development uh, with all GitHub Copilot and ID support for type hints. It makes pa it possible for ID to suggest the code. It makes it easier to give us the documentation at hand when we need it. And if and if we don't need to remember documentation, it's actually great design, right? Because yeah, we don't have to think about stuff that doesn't really matter. How does the param name is with uh, extra suffix or not? It will just give us the answer immediately. So these three things, yeah, yeah four, except for memory management, it's great out. Uh, documentation, business model validation, and type hints are like, for me, uh, the main reason I found out during my journey. Uh, why people do like having static project, why they do like to have this validation layer before merge request and stuff, because it just makes the work a, a little bit easier, right? You would like, if, if I give you the opportunity to jump into the existing project, one that is fully typed and the second that is uh, duct typed, probably you should choose uh, the, static, the static one. It's easier, it's just, so nice to jump to the project and do something in the first day and it works. But yeah, it's uh, a little bit disappointing because I was looking for arguments for duck typing. Are there any fans on this uh, talk that really prefer duck typing over static typing? Hands up. Okay, few, nice. <laughs> Three. Okay, not that many, not that many. And uh, actually, it's a bit dis disappointing. Yeah, but let's, let's explore the duct typing uh, pros then, right? Uh, first thing is that typing model, this example is in Python, takes time. I took the uh, challenge that authors of URL 3 took. Uh, I took my open source project uh, that I developed for seven years now. It's small, it's compact, all edge cases were covered like years ago. Anything I do there is just pumping the Python version and see if it works. So probably maybe it's not anything that would give me any value. And the code is again too small, doesn't matter. Uh, the thing is that I spend like lots of hours trying to uh, add type hints to my project. And I felt just that it didn't give any value to the project. Like not value for developers. I know they will be glad that the lib they are using is a bit more nice to handle. But it's not like someone will make a deployment of this new library, new version of this library to production because it will make new business values available for customer. No, it's just for developers. Uh, and because of that, it's not full history. We must remember that learning of domain is bottleneck too. Uh, it's nice to have static typing and everything. If your domain is kind of static as well, like you're diving into the project, I don't know, finance, everything is known, no surprises, every possible edge case is covered, you just want to know what's in there. Uh, but what about startups? What about greenfield projects? What about the very common case where customers simply doesn't know what he wants? In such situation, there is always a prototype, even if someone tells, yeah, I know what I want. I don't believe you because look at that. This is universal serial bus. Very universal, as you can see. They're actually releasing a new version of this bus once a few years, so it can be even more universal. 
Uh, and if you're in the process of making something like that, and how much do we have it? Like nine steps. Uh, and I think there will be more in the future, I think. If you're in the second step, you don't really want to be fully statically typed project because it takes so much time and effort just to make a draft or something that will be thrown in the trash anyway. And there is life, not life, uh, actual example of one of my project which I took some time ago. And it was perfect. Uh, it was like excellent in technical terms. Everything was typed, everything was tested, everything was described in documentation, etc. But customer changed its mind like two times a month. And each two weeks we had to rewrite everything because each time we, we discovered new part of the domain that even the guy didn't know about existed. And this is, uh, this is huge impediment. Uh, making this code like free of my pie was a movement for a better change because simply made development much faster. And although this project was a disaster, uh, actually spending less time in a pit hall is a good right. Uh, is a good as well, right? Like if you can spend time less on pointless stuff. And the third thing uh, where you would like to use duct typing uh, as a first option are one timers and projects for studies obviously because who would like to spend more hours on studies project than it's required, right? Like we can do stuff in Java and C++ and Python. What would you choose? I would choose Python because it's fast. I can dump it later without feeling that, feeling that much guilty. And sometimes there are projects that are simply made for being prototyped. Mm, I've run into some projects that had this in papers that the company will make only a prototype and if that proves it works, it will be scrapped and other company will do the actual job. So why invest time in typing all the stuff and testing 100% if all you need is a facet like for Western movies? It looks nice, it proves it works, that's all we need. Uh, so in general, uh, one more thing to this, to this, uh, to this one-timer project. Uh, if it happens that customer changes his mind, because it, you know, happens, and we have this one-timer project that is very ugly and nasty and nobody wants to work in it, you can actually transist from duct-typed project to statically typed one with something called gradual typing. Uh, it's a term to describe languages that can be both static and dynamic at the same time. And although Python is not fully ready for being called fully static, uh, statically typed, uh, I had some issues with uh, making this work for pretty complex uh, parts like dealing with meta classes or descriptors. It's really hard to make an annotation that simply works for MyPy. Uh, but you can make your life a bit easier. You can make life of your developers in the team a little bit easier by gradually uh, moving from dynamically typed to statically typed uh, Python. And to be honest, I do that all the time right now because if we have a new, new part of the domain that will be uh, implemented soon and nobody really knows how will it look, we have parts in the code that are statically typed, test, etc., etc., and then we can create a new merge request with just this small domain for, as a proof of concept, see if it's working, even deploy it on production behind the uh, feature flag, and if it's not working, do another version. And once we are there, we know what we want actually, because this also, this is a very good question, what do you actually want to customer? Once we are there, we can then make it like, give some, uh, love, static love to that as well. Uh, our record is, I think for that case, we, we had such case on production when we didn't really know what customer wanted. We only know what he didn't want once we deployed something. And there was also a 
big environment to mock every time we would like to make it testa testable. Uh, so we decided let's run the very dirty code on production, see how it goes, and then maybe proceed. We had the record of seven deploys a day to find out what customer really wants. It's so much faster than making the full environment for testing that will take a week just to know it's not what he wants anyway. I think that's mostly it for pros and cons for typing. In terms of this question, D question, right, and D problem, uh, that uh, learning is bottleneck, and there is much more to typing itself. I just didn't want to bloat it with uh, yada yada talking about stuff. I think these are more most important stuff uh, in the question, but actually we should change the question. The question should sound like this. Why do people want their project to be static? So it's not fallback again, sorry for that. Uh, and it's not language anymore, because it's not about language, it's about project. That question, answer to that question is, because people don't like to learn. It's always annoying to jump into a new project uh, and trying to grasp everything, and you need to ask someone that's not, uh, not uh, working there anymore for stuff. To make this a bit easier, I allowed myself to change this graph, and this is complexity of product development from Scrum Org. Uh, it's to the graph, but actually it has uh, like three axes, uh, requirements, people, and technology. So with, all, with uh, every hour, uh, arrow here, we're making uncertainty bigger. So we have technology that we know what technology we use or we don't. Uh, we have people that rotate or stay in the project and requirements uh, that we do not know or we do know. And this graph itself is a great guide to show you what approach you should be using in your project. Is it Scrum or is it Waterfall? Because in this simple left down corner simple case, you should use Waterfall. So I remade that to answer the question when you should use static and when dynamic. Uh, and it's like that. So we have requirements. On the bottom left, we have unknown requirements and known at the top. We have code base size, uh, and we have developer's rotation. Because if we run our improbability drive, and let's imagine we have this small project, and there is two or one developer for a short amount of time, and nobody knows what is happening there because we need to find the, the answer. It's like being in a uh, startup again. You should use as dynamic stuff as you can, but you know, with time, it grows, uh, it gets older. Uh, developers join, they rotate, they need to have static annotations to know what's in there for them. So if I would like for you to remember one thing, of this talk, because you already probably forgot the, the rest, is that if you have very dynamic problem, dynamic domain, you should use it. Treat static as a tool or knife that is easy to use and slowly curves your way through. And use dynamic approach as a machete. Sorry, I'm for, I studied in Krakow. So use it as a machete to cut your way through the jungle, to see what's behind the hill, then get back and prepare better for what's, uh, what's coming. And yeah, the secondary question is, is duct typing better than static typing? Well, the answer is very simple, 42. I don't know what you have expected anyway. Yeah, so I think that's it from my side. I'm reminding you that we are recruiting. Please meet us at the stand. We have recruitment session tomorrow as well, and maybe there are some questions. Yeah, I think we have one or maybe two. So uh, the first one is, uh, uh, I think it refers to your, one of your first examples. Do you really think that type hints could replace doc strings? Uh, I hope to. Like, if you combine the um, type annotations with clean code from Uncle Bob, 
probably you could get to the point when they are not needed. But that's uh, obviously not only about type hints, it's about code organization. So the code um, explains itself. But yeah, it's a bit optimistic and I don't think we can get rid of doc strings at all. You can just minimize its impact. Uh, we have two other which are kind of uh, similar. Uh, to what level of detail do you think typing should be used? Uh, like a, just a callable or, or maybe you also list the arguments and uh, Yes, that's a very good question. And I think I will follow the uh, Rust path because whatever is public, whatever is like interface to any of your modules, uh, it should be typed. And if it's uh, private or protected, like you start in Python with the name, with the underscore, right? That's a convention. If you use it just as internal use, as internal uh, variables, it's actually a bit of too much work to handle. Like I skip them when I can. So the input and output are always typed. Uh, yeah, I think that answers also the, the other question. Uh, what's your approach on circular dependencies? Uh, that's also a funny question because uh, while trying to introduce typing to my library, it's called JSON models, uh, I run into the issue that they are interconnected in many ways. And if I try to make a blob of constructs that are common to everything, I need to do something uh, like make a common ground of types or bases just for sake of these bases. They are doing nothing, which also generates a few problems. Put them at the top, so every part below uh, can import it. Of course, it's not always achievable. And in that case, I recommend some kind of uh, injection, dependency injection or inversion of controls. Because if two things uh, operate so strictly, it's actually the only way to uh, create boundaries, define them uh, in different places, test them, and then maybe connect together as a dependency injection. Uh, do you think Python is trying to achieve what TypeScript did? Definitely yes. Like it's, um, we have more existing projects in the world than the new ones, right? That's just uh, how life goes. Uh, therefore, these big old projects need better typing, and uh, mm, definitely it would be. Uh, valuable for companies to have uh, something that can be really described. As I said, Python is not there yet. I don't know if it's actually achievable fully without releasing something like Python 4, but it's not the way to go, right? It, will, it could generate a lot of problems as well. Thank you. Uh, so someone's asking, uh, actually, they, start that, they saw a lot, lot of rust in Python community lately, and do you think it has something to do with it being static? Uh, yes and no. Like the static uh, static type hints are one of the reasons, and the second is that if you have really well described uh, Rust code and it works, that's all you need to know because it must cover every possible solution. And, and the third thing, so that's just a way of uh, certainty for your application that not many languages can give, right? If you have something written in Rust, it's probably, because it's so strict, it's actually super hard to program in after like reading a few books and half years, half year of, of work, I managed to run uh, like blinking diode on my Raspberry Pi, which is great success for me. <laughs> Uh, so it's so hard, but then if you do this, it's so uh, concrete, like you cannot really destroy it. And the third reason is uh, Rust compared to other statically typed languages, uh, especially the system ones, uh, system one uh, is like uh, more nicer than, let's say, Java. 
Uh, and Rust also addresses the problems that currently Python has in, in, in packaging, let's say, because packaging in Python is still undefined. They lately made some polls about how to, how to approach this, and Rust simply does it, just like that. So, and of course, uh, type annotation uh, in Rust is so complicated that covers most of the problems in Python. So I think because Rust made it nice, and without being clunky as Java, it actually is source of inspiration for Pythonistas to dive into it. Uh, what do you think about um, MyPy alternatives? Are there any? Sorry. <laughs> uh, I haven't tried anything except for MyPy, so I can't answer that. Uh, type hints in unit test. Uh, rather not. Like I do, I do annotate types with return type none because I'm lazy to make exception in my pie, but I don't think them they are any useful. They just there to satisfy my pie. Uh, any hints how to enforce types in untyped project? Uh, like uh, for instance, uh, type new code while allowing old code to be untyped. Uh, there are two approaches. First is to create a new one and wrap it around in a typed manner. It's kind of like rewriting project to different language because let's be honest, if you have untyped language, there is so much magic that trying to grab it with types that Python provides might be impossible because uh, if you have like layers of code and something in the bottom returns anything, and it will simply blow your code uh, to return anything at the output. So it's not actually helpful. So I would rather treat Python and type Python as different languages, wrap around, and then slowly migrate to new approach. Uh, do you use protocols, or is it too much staticness? Uh, that's a very good question, and I'm like uh, biased on this. I don't really know how to approach protocols yet. Maybe I'm looking for case where protocols solve my problems and if I find it, I will stick to it. Uh, but they are excessive, that's true. But I can't give honest answer on that. Uh, do you type also attributes, uh, not only the parameters? Yeah, if they are public, then yes. Mm, let's see. Uh, yeah, the question is about Pydantic. There is also a pretty nice use case for typing uh, with Pydantic, which Pydantic is trying to exploit. Have you played with it? What's your opinion on that? Mm, well, I don't know if I understand correctly about uh, nice uh, use of case for typing which Python, what, what it's actually trying to exploit, because if it's about Pydantic use, then definitely use Pydantic. Uh, but maybe someone want to explain what the exploit is? Because I don't know. Like, I do like Pydantic, because if you, uh, maybe go back to that uh, chart here, uh, we have this orange complicated stuff, right? The projects that will be partly typed and partly not. And as I said, the reason against typing sometimes must be, may be time to dive into the domain. But at the same time, uh, if you type your res IP responses and data structures with Pydantic, it's like no brainer. It takes no time to, to consume. You just write it anyway. So uh, maybe partly answering the question, you should use Pydantic as much as possible in defining public responses, and if it, that's exploit, then yeah. Uh, so, Mirak asks, what's the best starting point for introducing typing to a Python project? Um, make pull request with MyPy enabled, then cry a bit because you see how many errors there is. Uh, then consider if it's actually possible to move uh, to type Python uh, 
project without changing API too much. This is something I talk from experience. I try to move this JSON models project, and, it, and I'm stuck because, as I said, mm, the project that was written without tests in the first place, I know it's not typing. If you write a code without tests, then it's not testable, right? You need to write tests alongside your code, so it, the code units are able to, you are able to test them. And with typing, it's a bit similar, I think, because if you try to make an addition to types later, the code itself kind of fights you back. So it might be required to re rewrite the, the code structure, the project structure, just to be able to give the type hints. But start with merge request, see how many error is there, try to fix as many as possible, and see if you run into the wall, if you're stuck then maybe try a different approach. Uh, isn't adding useless type annotations like non-returns in tests uh, to satisfy a tool actually making the code harder to read? Definitely yes. That's why I hate it sometimes. But um, it's not for me only, right? If you write code only for yourself, it, only for yourself, it can reflect the internal brain structure of yours. How did you think about this project? How do you think about the problem? But when you're sharing the code with other developers, um, it's actually for them to make this easier for them. So although it's dirty and I don't like it, I still do it. Uh, function factories, how detailed should be the output type? as much so you can understand what's it, what it's doing. I know it's a vague answer, but I know you can dive into describing stuff uh, very deeply, but mm, in that case, like, I had, this, I had this case where function is returning JSON, right? And JSON is a structure of dict or value or list which encloses itself with value or dict or list and so on and so on and so on. So I simply type JSON as any, that's their TA, and I'm returning JSON, which is simply alias for, uh, for, for any, but then developer, when he reads that, he understands what he can expect. So the function should be either aliased or described enough, so it gives you the idea what it actually does. It's uh, the answer for the question, uh, to yourself as well, like, what, uh, what is it doing? Oh, that's a funny one. How many MyPy error errors do you have in your project? <laughs> a lot, I didn't count. Uh, so I had files like, so I said, as I said, this is a small project. This is like four files of 500 lines at most. And I had like 100, but mostly these are like, uh, no type annotation for functions, uh, especially for tests. So you can get rid of them like 70% in the first hour just by annotating stuff. And now I'm trying to solve like um, 30. And this is something that uh, creators of URL 3 pointed out, that if you do typing in Python, it actually shows inconsistencies within your code, because there are inconsistencies. There is magic. There is meta class that does magic stuff to any model you define. It's actually hard to describe it before uh, making proper models of data structures you want to operate with. So instead of behavior, now we are trying to grasp the data structures that are exchanged between functions and methods and this is nice, but it's also very hard, so I didn't really solve that yet. So I'm dealing with like 30 something errors, but you can go to JSON models on GitHub and see on uh, GitHub runner how many is there. And maybe you could help. I really would like for, for you to help, really. Uh, so this one is about Django. Have you found a good way to use typing in Django project? Uh, do you think Django stops and MyPy will work perfectly with Django and the RM? Uh, well, that's a complicated case because you should use uh, as many as you can without running into the issues of endlessly solving typing. 
but uh, I think it's a responsibility of Django right now to provide version of Django that can be typed. As I said, this is a recurring problem because we are adding type hints into something that already existed, and if it's broken uh, at the very beginning of how it works, you cannot fix that. You can only kind of cover it with a big ball of typing mud and hope it works, but it's, it, sh it will not be very helpful. So unless uh, projects like Django at every possible most downloaded frameworks will be typed, it's actually a bit pointless. So type as much as you can, so it benefits you, but no more. Oh, I'm sorry, I closed this one too fast. Uh, is writing type annotations worth the effort in cases where they would be very complex, typically, typically in legacy code bases and annotated retroactively? Yes, especially if you're trying to understand what's happening inside. Uh, as I said, there are cases like very lasagna code that moving parts around, you don't really know what's inside. IDEA will not help you because it doesn't know what's in there too. Uh, so annotating only a bit and not too much, so you will not get the code to fight back might help you to understand the problem better. Uh, yeah, I think we uh, run out of questions. Uh, so thank you again. Yep, thank you, and <laughs> see you later.